a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a run. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very profound. Expanding reality. Jason, Mimi, welcoming to Expanding Reality. It is so damn cool to see you both. Uh, you both had my boy Pat Mahan up on your show, which all the ways to find you guys, of course, uh, you know, uh, doesn't need to be said, but we'll say it anyhow, are located down in the show description. That's where you can find these two amazing souls that have an incredible story and a powerful message to share with all of us. So, Chase, Mimi, so nice to welcome you to the show. We usually do introductions rather at this point to where you just tell us a little bit about yourself. So, Let's do that now. Why would we break tradition, huh? <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, what a blessing to be here. We're yeah. absolutely uh, excited and stoked. Uh, and we just got back from a from a long vacation. This is our first podcast back in San Diego. And so a ton of chi and, and build up <laughs> uh, energy that we can provide today. Uh, Chase and Mimi, we are childhood sweethearts. Um, we fell in love as 90s kids. Uh, we got married super young, early 20s, uh, only to then realize we had no clue what we were doing. Uh, split up, divorced, completely went our separate ways. Uh, after three years of divorce, individually hitting complete health rock bottoms, we organically reconnect through our passion for medicinal mushrooms, fall back in love. Uh, and, and not on purpose either, by the way. Definitely not on purpose. Like totally Never, right? yeah. caught, in, caught us off guard. And we fall back in love with a new set of tools, a new set of interests. And uh, as we fall back together in love, we realize Yo, we need to start talking about this thing uh, and all of these medicines that we found to be so healing in this life uh, and thus created the medicine podcast and our extended uh, passion together for medicinal mushrooms and offer a couple of different medicinal mushroom products. Uh, and we've been doing that for a few years, just untangling, unwinding this beautiful mystery um, and putting our thoughts and breakthroughs on uh, via the podcast medium out to the world. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Now, had you both had your own encounters with uh, psilocybin before this, or was this a joint, like we came together, discovered it together, and have healed and moved forward to, with it together? No. Now, we grew up evangelical Christian, like kindergarten through high school, all the way through college, evangelical Christian. That's why we got married so young. Very, very emphasized in that community to do so. As we split apart, I had left the religion uh, in my 20s, and I went on somewhat of my own uh, journey and found actually what started with medicinal mushrooms. So that is like lion's mane, um, that is chaga mushroom, cordyceps mushroom, reishi, found myself in the health and wellness industry, kind of the startup culture of adaptogens and superfoods, and found my way to psychedelic uh, medicines like psilocybin, had my own journey when we were divorced, but it has now become a part of our our life together. And and, and I ended up introducing uh, Mimi to it as we reunited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he actually exposed me to this world before we were even back together. We were just talking as friends. We had this sort of liminal space of a, of a few months where we were just texting, calling each other on the phone, but there was no like, oh, maybe we'll get back together. It was literally just, we've both gotten to this place where we can wish well for each other. We have this history. We have this chemistry together. Let's just be friends. And so we were speaking in this way. And Chase had uh, a really powerful uh, mushroom experience and told me about it because I, I had appeared in this uh, vision, this experience with him. And because I had witnessed firsthand his, or I guess secondhand through him telling me, 
this opening and this expansiveness in him related to this mushroom experience, uh, specifically as it pertains to God and the universe and, and a bigger energy that that is available. Um, I was just really happy for him. And so it really piqued my interest. I, I had no judgment whatsoever, even though I still considered myself a Christian and hadn't engaged in this in this world at all. I didn't even know anything about it. But I had just seen the change in him, how he was portraying himself, how he was speaking. And it just seemed like a brighter, shinier, kinder, sort of soft, but still assertive, just a more balanced version of the man that I married. And I was like, whatever you're doing, it seems to be working very well for you. And that just piqued my interest. Yeah. Overall. And we were divorced at this time. But what had led to our reconciliation of just being friends even was uh, medicinal mushrooms. And like I said, I had started working in the industry and, and being a part of a, a company that was that was formulating and putting forth superfood products that included medicinal mushrooms, completely independent of that life while we're separated. I mean, we're years without talking to each other. Mimi had left her dental hygiene career to study the powers of medicinal mushrooms. And she had specifically studied a mushroom, which now we offer to the world called AHCC. And so she had heard that I'd similarly navigated my way through some mutual friends to this sort of adaptogenic superfood world. And so we just hit it off with like, dorking out about medicinal mushrooms, which was, which is so funny that it's, and I'm not funny, it's, it's a complete synchronicity. Uh, now just such a pillar of the passion that we bring forth to our business. I love it. And yes, you're uh, pointing him to the pillar here. Check the video version of this, guys, in the show notes. If you're an audio only listener, uh, link is down there. It's an amazing story. It's an incredible story. And I definitely have here to ask you about your experiences. And so I, I I'd like to know, you know, before we go into that, what your relationship looked like coming back together. Mimi, where was it that you also found the same things in religion were lacking moving forward with you? Was this mm -hmm. after being reinduced, reintroduced into the new chase? Or was this sort of a personal journey that led you there and then it just coincided when you got back together? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it was completely my own journey. When Chase and I came back together, I was still very much identifying as a quote unquote Christian. And I had spent the year prior really diving into like, hey, what did Jesus actually talk about? And I just studied his words and his teachings for a long time. And because I was like, I feel like I've, uh, we hear all these stories and people tell us like what this means and what that means from the pulpit but like what if i just like dove into my my own study and like try to interpret for myself because this was a sticky point for me in religion was constantly doubting my own interpretation we all have our own interpretation similar to tarot cards it's like it's gonna it's gonna feel different for each person reading the text and interacting depending on what's going on in your psyche in your life your circumstances and that's okay but when i was growing up in the church i thought that that was something wrong with me that i I would hear the pastor or the preacher speak about a verse and I completely wouldn't have come to that conclusion of what that verse meant. And I thought it meant that there was something wrong with me. So I really was like, okay, I'm going to leave that behind. I'm going to release that like limiting story about myself and just do it for myself. Just study, just read and just open yourself to the teachings that might be available through this historical or not historical, but certainly cultural figure of Jesus. So I did that. And so my mind was already open to what am I experiencing? What do I want to experience? How do I want this relationship with Jesus or God or whatever with religion? What do I want it to look like? What do I want it to feel like? So we, that was where I was at when we got back together. And Chase was so wonderful, not for one second, even though he had left Christianity and was exploring these other realms and worlds. He didn't for one second try to convince me out of what I was experiencing as a, as a Christian. He was supportive. We would engage in dialogue. He would ask me questions, but not once did I feel pressured to change my beliefs. Really, what did it for me, what really was the flip of the switch was I was listening, actually Chase was listening to Paul Check. Not sure if you're familiar with Paul Check. He's one of our great mentors and great friends. Um, early on in our part two of our relationship, 
Chase was listening to this podcast and Paul Check had mentioned this book called Prayers of the Cosmos. And it was it's a book basically where uh, the author, Neil Douglas Klotz, is translating Jesus's English words, really, he's going back to the roots of Aramaic and giving you the original Aramaic translation of what we all know as these, you know, the the Lord's Prayer and the Beatitudes, we know them in English, but Jesus didn't speak English. He didn't think like our Western American brains. And so, what did an, a person who spoke Aramaic, what did he think? How did he approach the world and teaching? And so, this book really just opened my opened my mind like just cracking open a coconut and i was just like oh my god there's so much more to this than i originally thought that was the flip of the switch to realize like there's so much more here and then you, you i read that book and then it led to this book and then led to that book and led to christian mysticism and then from there we were having our our psychedelic experiences and, you know, there is this one specific psychedelic experience. The, one of the first times I think that we did a, a very low dose of mushrooms together, uh, low enough that we could walk around the island and interact with each other. And it wasn't scary to look at other people. <laughs> um, I had had this, you know, just experience out. We were walking around on our island and really powerful experience. And I came back and just had this urge to open the Bible. And I went right to some of Jesus's teachings and I was like, holy shit. Jesus was so awake. He is speaking about the same things that I'm feeling in my body right now. Like the kingdom of heaven was within, is within you. You don't need anything else outside of you. You have all the answers within you. And that's how you feel when you're on mushrooms or on different psychedelic experiences. I was like, oh my God, Jesus was totally a hippie. <laughs> that's how it felt at the time. So that was really the kickoff to me just opening and just saying, hey, whatever this experience has for me, I'm not going to force anything. I'm going to follow my intuition. I'm going to follow my gut. I'm going to follow the flirts of nature and intuition and all of that. And it's it's landed me in a place where I don't really know what I am. I wouldn't label myself as anything. I'm just here trying to experience as much as I can and learn from the lessons that are coming at me and have a relationship with the divine spark that I think exists in everything if we but see it that way. Yeah. I mean, holy <laughs> yeah. Like, couldn't, uh, perfect. We're just like, yes, yes. Uh, to the book that you were talking about here, I went ahead and pulled it up while we were talking. Uh, video version is located down in the show description, guys. So, Prayers of the Cosmos, very cool. Um, it, it is fascinating. It's now on my list, so I'm absolutely going to take a look at this. Another uh, book, actually, that I was curious if you had heard of in relation to this would be The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. Have you guys ever yeah. heard of this? John I have. Yeah. I have not read it, but I've definitely heard of it. It's on the list, right? And in this, yeah. this is one of the deciphers of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this guy actually anthropomorphized that the whole uh, story, rather, of Jesus was an anthropomorphization of the sacred mushroom and that God, whenever he was reigning on earth, was jizzing on earth and then, right. uh, you know, the uh, sun. And then that's how you connect with him. That's how it's reborn in this earth. So it, it wasn't taken as... Um, silly as it would be now as we all chuckled at that i didn't don't disagree with that um but it is an interesting concept i was also watching a video on TikTok the other day i shared it uh on my instagram but it was about how the beginnings the entrance points to cathedrals are actually all mushrooms and now you cannot unsee this have you guys seen that mm, no so. i'll pull it up uh, while we're talking about this but what do you guys think about that idea that the guy that deciphered the dead sea scrolls john m allegro has to say about the mushroom being really more of an allegory for Jesus rather than a literal person walking around here. Yeah, I love that. I love that idea. And I even Old Testament, like you're talking about the Exodus story and you hear of mana, which is this what we were described in Christian school is this bread like food that was provided to the Israelites on their exodus from Egypt. Um, and it would occur after, you know, the rain. And so rain would fall from the sky and this mana would appear essentially the next morning, which anybody who's who's noticed a, a good rain and, and the follow up to that being, you know, mushrooms seemingly popping out of nowhere to full fruiting body uh, is, is almost like an active miracle if you're not if you're not familiar with that type of growing speed. And so that totally makes sense to me. 
is that one could su- suggest, oh my God, God provided this mana, this bread, this flesh of life, and we can connect with the divine every morning when we get this mana provided to us. And so I love that um, story and that that analogy. And then I think there's so many similarities with what Jesus talks about, even the figure of Jesus, the avatar, the archetype of the Christ, um, with what you end up going through in a deep psychedelic experience where you you quite literally follow the hero's journey and and you give some level of death to your mm-hmm. ego body Surrender. or your physical nature and realize that there's a, a non-bound by time connection to a divine uh, greater intelligence or purpose that if you so lean into can experience the nectar of life, the elixir of life, if you will, and thus step back into the physical with that awareness and integrate it back into uh, gifting the rest of the world. And and so I, I love kind of that similarity between the things that Christ talks about, the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection, and that not unlike the hero's journey, not unlike what you go through in a deep uh, medicine experience, which usually hits on a lot of those same same chords and those same themes. Perfectly said, dude. Absolutely. God, thank you, Ryan Sprague, by the way. I think he's the one that connected us. Yeah. 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 So Ryan, dude, shout out. You will be located down there as well. Just a link for, for your kindness there, brother. Wanted to pull up this while we're on the topic of it, just because I thought it was so damn interesting. And this is just one of those fun things, you know. Actually, let me share my audio we're doing all this on the fly so thank you audio only audience for just hanging out with this but you really should check out the video version we're having a good time over here so this dude came up with this uh, cathode cathedral energy harvesting mushroom cult initiation portal that's exactly (laughs) what this is you may or may not have seen the countless videos online right now about how cathedrals are cathodes and are really just energy harvesting stations of ethereal energy, right? And that's fascinating. But this video is not about that. This video is about how these buildings are mushroom cult initiation portals. That's right. To demonstrate my point, I'm simply gonna move out of the way and show you the entranceway of every major cathedral. Here we go. Hmm, can you see it there? Do you see the mushroom? Yeah. Let's try another one. The audience is describing these. How about doorways. now? Uh, Can you see the, the mushroom the now? The doorways actually are hmm. split by a center column that then has a mushroom. Do you see the mushroom? Do you see the mushroom? I just can't unsee uh, the shit now. Come on. Uh, I know you can see that mushroom. Yeah. These are really obvious. Not only is this clearly a mushroom right here, right? Here's your stalk, here's your cap. But this up here, this space right here, that's the illumination. That's the aura of the mushroom. Told you. To further prove the point, this is the entrance to Notre Dame Cathedral. Take a look. Down there is how the mushroom would be symbolically. And here's the actual construction. Mm. Here's one from my hometown. This is the Cathedral de Madeleine here in Salt Lake City. Look at that mushroom. As a mushroom. As if I already haven't made it super obvious. This one is Bristol Cathedral in Bristol, UK. Outlined to make it just so clear. That looks exactly like a cell. Two set. books you're going to want to reference. Falconelli's The Mystery of the Cathedrals. And the other book is The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross by John Marco Allegro. No, no. So Translator. That's it. Um, that's what I wanted to share on that. Now, that will be located down in the show notes. I'm going to go ahead. I've noted to link it here. But it's a fascinating video. And shout out to that creator, I'm unable to read it at this time, and I'm not even going to confuse it. So it'll be located down in the show notes, so you guys can go uh, directly to his account and see that. Amazing information, though, and these sort of mushroom cults, it, it makes sense now, looking at it through this lens, that there may be something so much deeper to this mushroom thing. What do you guys think about all that? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that <clears throat> most ancient religious texts, and and I'm not an expert by any means, but I did grow up in Christianity and have been pretty indoctrinated in the tradition, but have in my psychedelic adult life, gone back and reflected on some of the large themes and God, they're so mystical. 
Yeah. They're so, so metaphysical. And when you kind of move past the literal interpretation that at least the community that we came out of suggested was the case, you start to see a lot of the major themes mm -hmm. that one could probably only pick up on through these out of body type experiences. And it's hard not to think that they were psychedelic, psychedelically inspired. And even through my own research into mystical Christianity, the roots of, of ancient Hebrew and what evolved into Christianity, so much of Christianity was quite mystical in nature. This Jesus figure who was interpreted in a host of different ways subsequent to the historical figure's death was really kind of consolidated through the institution of uh, the Roman Empire in order to be some sort of governing religion that was more fit for the times in the community. But its actual origin was super, super mystical. These these Christian cults is essentially what they were, were performing breath work, were in caves for days, fasting and having these experiences. And so even if there wasn't evidence of some sort of psychoactive substance, which you read the book by Brian Moresco and, and talk to him uh, through or listen to him through various interviews, there's even evidence that there are psychedelic substances that were involved in early church traditions. But even if you don't want to align with that, it is clear that these types of interpretations or, or breakthroughs as it pertains to just the religion at large really came from some level of <clears throat> mystical experience that was brought on through a modality like breath work or darkness, these things that are now resurfacing as uh, really beautiful practices for one's own spiritual journey. And so I think these traditions of removing oneself from just the physical uh, experience go really, really deep through most religions and especially in Christianity or Hebrew that have this bedrock of the a psychedelic like mm -hmm. experience you could say arguably even the the garden of eden story allegory could have an interpretation i've heard many interpretations of course but like one interpretation is that the apple is not actually an apple it's it's uh something else it's you know amanita muscaria or something like that and she's interacting with this snake with nature and he's illum illuminating offer this vehicle, this tool of illumination where you can open your eyes to your divinity, expand your reality. Um, and so it's, it's, it's sort of a, a fun interpretation. Of course, we, we don't know for sure, but it is a, it is a fun one. There's so many throughout the Bible, the burning bush, right? Uh, you know, like there's so many stories where once you have, once you remove yourself from the literal interpretation, this is what we were taught as kids growing up in the church is like, all of these words are absolutely true. It's not a story. It's a literal, this literally happened. This is basically a history book <laughs> and it's sort of laughable now when I think about it, but there's so much rich allegory and, and lessons to be, to be learned in these, in these texts, in these stories. And it's not unlike our own experiences with an eye shade and, you know, in our, in our condo laying down for a few hours. Yes, I love that you put it this way and put it to the stories in the Bible as well. It's a brilliant tie-in with all of this, guys, you're, you're just crushing here. And it does feel like maybe even Jonah and the Whale would be another one of these, you know, these uh, psychedelic experiences such as ayahuasca, people being consumed by huge snakes and things that mm. they're looking at and then feeling and then feeling being birthed from or breaking out from the inside. So all these metaphors, maybe somebody was having on a psychedelic experience. And it's uh, interesting to me as well, you mentioned the breath work and all of that. We've done, we did a retreat in uh, April with uh, Brandon Powell, man, and we did this incredible breath work, and it was this powerful. I felt something moving in me, and uh, to the Garden of Eden thing, yes, the apple may represent the mushroom or some sort of sake, um, icon of uh, sacred psychedelic wisdom that's encapsulated. Maybe that's different per culture, but the mushroom is a nice uh, symbol for it, and I think especially how it connects to human beings, and we'll we'll touch on that. Um, but then also, you uh, dive into these rabbit holes of maybe it was just sort of more of a uh, uh, like you said, it's, it's literal in nature, but it really can be translated and felt in a deeper way. And that's when you really start to look around and see all of these things. And the connective nature is as well as just in the experience. And Chase, I love that you mentioned this. It's not just about the feeling and the freaky woo-woo. Like I always get 
I always went into my psychedelic experiences looking to have fun. That's just me by nature. I'm a let's go do it. But inevitably, I always knew that that always led to some deep understanding. And it's just kind of inherent in me to make everything deep. So I, it's it was no problem for me to go in with the intention of having a blast because I did. But also I was like, everything's connected. Can you guys feel it? But we were having fun and it wasn't in a scary way of collapsing your reality. It was in an expansive way of really seeing this a little bit further. So human beings in the sense that uh, Terence McKenna talked about this in his Food of the Gods with his uh, stoned ape theory. And it seems that the mushroom in particular seems to be one of those icons of early civilization of us breaking out. It wasn't till later sort of that we had that experience that even ayahuasca and those plants spoke to the indigenous and then gave them that. There were probably mushrooms before all of that, right? So it is interesting how connected we are to this. So very random question. Do you think that the psychedelic mushroom is specifically for humans to be attractive to us because of our core in nature? And do you think that maybe other substances here, ayahuasca, DMT, peyote, anything like that, maybe has another spiritual connotation in that you're connecting with different parts of another deeper level of like a past version of you? So mm. uh, it seems to me that the that these psychedelics here at a level, and this is we're just having fun with it, are really specific to an area, a location, and then people incarnate in that area location, if you want to say that and you kind of follow this around, then what you're available to or what psychedelics are available to you in that area that you're gravitated towards, and this is a whole bunch of what ifs, if you're led down that path, if you take that choice, you know, if you're questioning yourself, if you do the work, all of those things, then what you find at the end of that rainbow in more uh, centralized cultures was just what's near you. And so you get this idea that all of these things are sort of planted where the ideas come up from. So you had these interesting things coming out of Siberia with the Amanita muscaria and those type of experiences, but then you had other seemingly connected but very specific experiences with indigenous cultures in South America with those experiences. So to all of that, there seems to be this just beautiful way that psychedelics is spread around the world, how we're attracted to it, and do you think it's specific locationally to how you interface with it? Hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah. I, I've never even thought about this. It's almost like it's almost like consuming local honey. Bees Perfect. are taking parts yeah. of, you know, they're they're getting the pollen and creating the honey that's local to your area. And then if you consume that honey, it sort of acts like a natural antibiotic where you're exposing yourself to the 15 most common different plants and you are arming yourself sort of in a natural way. It almost that's what I think of with and, and of course it, it could be. Um, I think that uh, it's all guesswork, but it is a it is a fascinating uh, concept to go down. And I think that there is definitely something there. I think the the piece with the mushrooms is interesting, um, separate from other types of plant medicines, because if you listen to someone like Paul Stamets, he explains that actually humans and mushrooms evolved from the same super kingdom. So a lot of people think of mushrooms as like a plant or a vegetable, and it's not. It's it's its own kingdom separate from animals and plants, but somewhere in the middle. They are sentient. They know that you're there. They shoot their little spores after you when you walk by them in the forest. You have no idea that they're there, but they know that you're there. And they're sort of offering themselves hidden, but out in the open. They might be under a leaf or a log, but they're uh, making themselves available. Sort of, I, I have the sense that they're making themselves available, one, for those who are looking for them, who are open to the idea, looking for them in the in the places that they, they can be found and offering themselves as sort of um, uh, as sort of a, a learning tool for the betterment of the earth as a whole. That's how I think of them. And I don't I don't even think that I'm actually answering your question. I'm just going down rabbit holes that my mind is taking me. The second guessing is what was unnecessary. You brilliantly answered the question. It was the funny <laughs> analogy, the uh, wrap up of the local and to the indigenous and how and how this makes a specific impact on you because of its uh, environment, because of its location. It, it's yeah, you answered it perfectly. You nailed it. Uh, Chase, what do you think about all that? Yeah, I'm I love that that question and i love this this lane that we're leaning into something you know and i haven't done the full bouquet of psychedelics and and i don't i don't think any of us have because we're just continuing to discover more and more and more about what's available um mushrooms to me have a unique uh integration possibility with the human experience and uh i think anybody who's 
partook in a, in a deeper mushroom journey has gone through a really similar pattern and set and setting of course is important. If you take it at a concert, it's going to be significantly different than with eye shades or in a ceremony with a facilitator or with your, your partner or your lover. But it seems to hit on really s- similar human patterns that we experience in our life, whether we like it or not. And so even in a sober life of no psychedelic activity, most people are going to come to to some moment where they are pushed into discomfort, where they hit the belly of the whale moment as their Jonah story um, it unfolds in their life. Um, where they think that that there is no hope left. And anybody who's gone through a deep mushroom experience, it starts off kind of light starts off kind of fun and bubbly and giggly. And you're like, am I feeling it yet? Is this what it's supposed to be? Oh, this is so great. And you're analyzing everything. You're like, oh, this must be it. And then you just get shot down into the absolute present moment. You lose physicality, you lose context for your own life. Hard to even process through certain lessons at this point. You're just feeling it and experiencing it and wondering if you'll ever get out of it. You know, maybe you're, you're wondering if, I don't know if there's an, if there's, you know, another side to this, but, but push through and work through, and then you're able to go back and go, oh my God, the lessons, of course, of course, like, of course this shows up and the human experience is going to offer that to you in the circumstances of your life, whether that's a tough relationship, like, like our story through divorce, whether that's health crises, whether that's uh, work or livelihood crises, these patterns play out over and over and over. And it's hard not to think that the availability, the resiliency of something like fungi and mushrooms specifically aren't meant to go through that experience emotionally and energetically prior to having to do it in your life such that you can pick up on the patterns and you go, Oh, wow. I just got fired from that job. Um, and this feels like that, that journey that I experienced through my rite of passage when I was 15 years old, going through a mushroom experience. I know that there's another side to this. I know that there's a purpose to this. This is the belly of the whale. This is the dark night of the soul. I'm going to sit in it. I'm going to process it, but I'm not going to suffer through it because I know on the other side of this is growth on the other side of this is evolution. And so let me just sit in here for the moment. I'm familiar with this pattern. I get, it gets better from here. And so I can't help but think that fungi and mushrooms aren't meant to be this little teacher of sorts for those cyclical patterns that humans go through throughout their life. And then it makes me wonder if these other psychoactives are for other archetypical human patterns, or maybe not human meat suit patterns. Maybe it's not for the the third density, if you want to look, you know, look at it this from a law of one standpoint. But maybe, you know, you go through a, a DMT experience like 5MEO and you just freaking blast off and all of a sudden you're in in Star Wars light speed, just like cruising off into nothingness. Maybe that's more for like our sixth density body or our etheric body oh, to take to take a lesson from. And so maybe we're getting this sort of like preview of what college would be like, even though we're in elementary school. Um, but it does, it does make me wonder, you know, like, are these different medicines, these different modalities meant for these sort of different stages of mm-hmm. consciousness as it evolves and as the soul evolves through this spirit school, if you want to look at the world that way. Dude, this is like timelines collapsing. This is awarenesses. This is uh, Laurel Erica. Adore her. Have you guys communicated with her yet? Yeah, we have. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um. So, uh, her uh, definition of the epiphany is, which is a sudden recognition of the obvious. And it seems so interesting. The further we get into, of course, the spirituality tie-ins, which we've talked about, the religious foundations and tie-ins to psychedelics, and it's absolutely established. Mystery schools, all of these things. It's a very insightful tool, as we've all discovered as psychonauts on our own personal journey. But now to think of it leveled up from a new perspective, from a perspective of like that you're doing a lot more healing than you think here by uh, going down the journey, not only that you are with your ancestors, with quitting drinking, if that's your thing, with whatever patterns and beliefs and all of that limitations that you're breaking. But in the psychedelic realm, especially, it, it, it seems like and now just viewing it through this lens, which you excited the shit out of me about is looking at it like you're healing your. Yeah, fifth density dude. You know, he really needs you to just go drink ayahuasca this weekend and chill the fuck out because all the resonance that you're holding here needs to be released in that way, but also it'll connect you in such a way. And maybe that's what these visitors and things are. They're your higher self at that level that knows exactly what to tell you that will get your shit together in this level so it can move the fuck on. Mm -hmm. I was speaking with somebody about this the other day, uh, Christy Forsyth, amazing. She and I were talking about this interconnectivity between you, your soul guides, these angels, these all, all these ideas of there being different 
let's say, things here that aren't visually available to us, but some are in psychedelic experiences, which a whole nother kind of peek between the behind the curtain here. And then you look at uh, things that how they connect and interact. And then you think of us here, like think of a, we're, uh, my wife and I decided not to help one kid. We decided to help billions this year, this time around. So we didn't have children, right? So as parents, though, you could see this on a micro level to where when you raise someone or you want the best for them and they do something totally fucked off, you're like, what is happening here? But if you two were in sync and you had a wonderful communication and you knew how to communicate with one another, think of the wisdom that your parents at a calm state healed could impart on you. Think of like uh, tribes and cultures which didn't have the structures we do under uh, all of this nonsense or whatever that we're breaking out of that had the grandparents staying at home with the children because they knew the wisdom and patience that they had imparted that knowledge and kept the bloodlines going and everything, all these beautiful traditions. So when you step back and look at what psychedelics is doing for you in the now, yes, but when you consider it at a bigger level, which is fun as fuck, then you're thinking that you're healing all of this and you're really tapping into all of these pieces of you. You're healing pieces of you here that are broken or damaged or could use a little loving uh, in another dimensional realm of you, which is fascinating mm -hmm. as fuck, dude. That is so interesting. Yeah. 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 It's like the micro and the macro of evolution. Of course, like all of nature is evolving all of the time. But also for that to happen, the individual units have to evolve, including humans. And so it's like in order for evolution to happen on a, on a macro scale, evolution needs to happen on a micro individual scale. And I think that that's where the, the plant medicines are making themselves available. It, I think more so now than probably ever in mainstream culture. Um, I know they had like the 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 wave in the the sixties and seventies and everything, but I think it's like it's happening. It's here. It's in conversation on podcasts. You know, millions and millions of people are hearing about it, becoming intrigued by it, and I think it's just kind of that boost that we need as a society and culture to get to the next level, but also on an individual level up the, you know, individual units of evolution. Yeah. And I think that, um, and I'm totally getting outside of my lane here because I'm, I'm by no means a psychonaut or a, or a psychologist, but like time and space are these containers to, to give us context in this three dimensional experience. Um, but they're just containers, right? And, and there is existence beyond them. And anybody who's mastered something, you've started from a very basic level and you've been, you've gone from disorder to order back to disorder in your stage of evolving into that craft and that, that mastery, you start with learning the technical components to a T and most masters or teachers would suggest that you fucking execute on the fundamentals before you can expect to be intuitively masterful at this craft musicians, athletes, they learn the technical pieces to a T and that the real masters are the ones who can dot every I and cross every T of the technical piece only to then get to the stage where you go, okay, forget everything now, turn that into your, your, intuition and start opening back up to freedom and disorder you have the foundation at this point and so i i think that as it pertains if we're talking about this existence being spiritual elementary school we're in the phase of hey guys we got to execute time and space right now we need to nail it with time and space but to a certain point where we evolve up the spiritual chain, there's a moment where it goes, forget all that stuff. You got it down now. You got it down. And, and it's important that you got it down, but there's a way to heal and expand beyond this. You're now into intuition and freedom and back to this space of disorder. Love it. And you touched on something I'm a big fan of, and uh, this awareness that was just gifted to me recently is this idea of temporary truths. It's just all of the things you know now are just temporary truths, no matter how awesome they feel no matter how absolutely certain you are of them there is always something much bigger going on that you're perceivably unaware of and, and even in that sense so even even just being aware of that mindful of that that opens all of the doors here that opens all of the all of the gifts we had a show with a guy named uh, andrew benjamin on and he said the uh, the answer to life is the mastery of questions i wrote it down here and i just mm -hmm. thought that, that was such an interesting statement to hang on to yeah. keep. so shout out andrew um okay so i do want to know what do you guys think about mushrooms being like an entity in themselves in the form of sort of an extraterrestrial one? Meaning that 
yes, humans and mushrooms, like you said, I love that, uh, that they come from the same kingdom. Do you think that we were brought here? Number one, maybe that's possible that we were both brought here and sort of evolved side by side as a co-collective creative of sorts to where this is maybe a physical representation of your spirit guide. It's like, dude, you have access to the divine anywhere. We know this place is fucking heavy. And maybe that's this idea that it evolved like this. And then also maybe this is why like UFOs look like mushrooms just that have a landing stock somewhere that that's where they park. You know what I mean? Maybe if you go to a UFO landing spot, there's really just a bunch of mushroom looking things everywhere because that's what they are. What do you guys think of them being sort of a side or even a consciousness of themselves? Yeah, I love that idea. I'm totally, totally open to that. Um, we all are aliens to some degree, right? <laughs> like we all have come here and co-created together to create where we're at today in 2023. And I would also suggest like mushrooms may be an obvious choice for that explanation because they just, you pop them and you shoot off into another realm, but go into the mountains and find a natural spring that's popping out of uh, a mountainous uh, ravine and hold your hand up to the to the wet rock crystal uh, shelf where fresh spring water is running off of the side of it and just sit there for two minutes. Good luck not having a psychedelic experience. So I would also say that this alien being that is the the stardust turned into crystal formation on the side of the mountain that bleeds pure drinkable water is also this this ally that we've been provided and we're to it. I mean, that's our responsibility to some degree is to ensure that, that it's able to, to flourish in nature. And so I would, I would look at so many other things as it pertains to uh, the natural life of planet earth and, and everywhere else to suggest that it might also be this co-creative companion that we have in the, the evolution of our consciousness. It just feels. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, please. <laughs> <clears throat> I was going to say, um, just knowing the um, the intelligence, not even fully knowing, I, I, that's so egotistical for me to say, but being exposed to a tiny portion of the intelligence that's available in mushrooms, I'm not going to pretend like I understand everything that's happening there. Um, just understanding a tiny portion of that, I can totally get on board not going to say I believe that this is true because I don't have any necessarily evidence of this, but I, I, this seems like a temporary truth right now for me where it's like mushrooms are so intelligent, adaptable, resilient, and useful. They're literally breaking down and building up our forest floors all of the time. Not only our forest floors, but you walk outside in Coronado and you're walking on mycelia. And so it's like they're everywhere and they're meant to be everywhere. I can absolutely see a reality or experience a reality where they've been either sent here on purpose or they've been floating out in the cosmos, landed on Earth and started propagating. And we're here uh Paul Stamets talks about after um, ca certain cataclysms thousands and thousands of years ago, the first things to arise from the ashes, so to speak, are giant mushrooms before plants, before you know trees and flowers and everything like that. It was mushrooms for thousands and thousands of years. And they were sort of rebuilding the ecosystem of our earth because they're so intelligent, resilient and useful. And they have their own perfect life cycle where they're breaking down, they're saprophytic, they're breaking down things that should be broken down, even like plastics and oil that are human ingenuity and uh, ambition is putting out into the world probably faster than we need to be. They're here to like, hey, we're going to help you break down these things where you're your allies. And uh, we see, we can see, we can sense. I think that they have a language all of their own through the mycelial network that we can't even come close to understanding. They are certainly community based. They are certainly, um, hey, I'm going to help you. You scratch my back. I'll scratch your back. They're sending nutrients and information to trees and plants and flowers under the earth. Uh, they're certainly contributing to a more beautiful world that all of us think or know is, is possible. And I can absolutely get on board with them being some sort of extraterrestrial sent here or traveled here thousands of years ago. 
it's like the word to describe them and and one that we would strive to embody is the word conscientious like that's mm-hmm. like the most the highest compliment i think you could give somebody i'm calling my wife that constantly i'm like baby you are so conscientious thank you and it's just yeah. thinking a little bit an extra step you know yeah it's it's been a perfect uh, alignment with just our story one because it quite literally brought us back together as it pertained to being the the medium for which we we started conversation after three years and then two its attributes are what we would suggest a romantic partnership should look like it's adaptogenic in nature it's conscientious in nature resilient resiliency community based and so there's so much that we've just fallen in love with, with even just the metaphor and and, and analogy for how a human relationship can look um, and, and with the core themes of, of mushrooms themselves. Y'all are just so beautiful. I, I'm just going to take a second here with the audience and just enjoy how much we're enjoying this all together. And this breath of fresh air, just the communication, just the openness, the fuck yes, the epiphanies. <laughs> just thank you so much. I mean, this is just so fun. Wonderful. So thank you. This okay. is our absolute love language. So oh, yeah. it's a pleasure. I, I know this is this is it. Right. And this is what it's all about. This is the mushroom speaking through us because this is the thing. We're all we're all conscientious. That's what we embody. And so same thing as you said. But these are the realizations that we can see, you know, as above, so below. It's right over there. Mushrooms are doing it. And they're crushing it. I mean, they're absolutely crushing it. In a way, they were the first things that established all of this. So why wouldn't they be a progenitor for wisdom, knowledge, and a, a great example of community in the way you just described? Absolutely love this. So I definitely wanted to make sure that we get back to Chase's story. Um, I want to hear your most profound experience, if you don't mind. If it is that one, awesome. I'm going to open it up to whatever you'd like, but also, Mimi, your most profound experience. I noted down here, make sure that we hear your most profound psychedelic experiences. Yeah, well, well, I'll uh, the one alluded to earlier in the conversation. Um, I'll speak to that. I grew up Christian uh, from birth, Christian community, and had never totally adopted the religion myself. Um, but it kind of was convenient, worked out for me. Really great childhood. Um, as I got into college, I actually went to a Christian college that um, gave a beautiful um worldview curriculum where the the idea was a liberal arts school the intention was to develop your worldview by the time you were a senior you took these core curriculum classes sociology psychology um religious history and that's all major world religions well i got into studying uh world religions and re- christian religious history and was like whoa this tons of contradictions this doesn't make sense the sunday school version that i got through elementary school and high school uh i had i had questions back then now i really have questions so much to the degree that i i left the religion or from identifying myself as a christian altogether and through through many who have gone through this route went straight into psych uh scientific materialism started out as like stoicism moved into scientific materialism, got obsessed with like Sam Harris and was really going down the rabbit hole of atheism, um, settled on just agnostic. Like, I don't fucking know I, if there's a God, he's kind of a dick. And and the personification of him, which I was still attached to that being the definition of God, this personification of this patriarchal figure. I was like, not for me. If there if he is up there, he's he's quite rude and but i was still really really fascinated i'm an early joe rogan listener all the way through college and had heard about psychedelics not having ever heard about them growing up and so i just told myself yo as soon as there's an opportunity i really want to experience this i'm all about just life experiences at large and so when when that occurred i was about 27 years old uh, got an opportunity to partake and I'd taken psychedelics at parties and stuff, uh, concerts and reggae concerts and things of that nature. And they were always kind of fun and bubbly. And, um, but in this case, it was a, a hero's journey, hero's dose version of, of a mushroom experience with a facilitator, um, out in, in a, a home up in the nature. And so it, I went real deep and, uh, just on my back out of my physical body in another realm, um, and I experienced what I interpreted at that point, some connection with love, which was, uh, you know, equal to God in that moment where I just had this understanding that this thing that I was interacting with, which just looked like a ball of light, <laughs> um, was love and was at least in that moment, a representation of God. And I had this experience where I was given, uh, the, the download, if you will, that 
I had cut myself off from experiencing love through my level of skepticism and bitterness as it pertained to the religion that I was brought up in. And it was an attribute of why we got divorced. It was an attribute of why I was successful and not happy. Um, it was an attribute why I was compulsive with certain areas of my life. Fitness and wellness is one of them. I'm, I'm, I was very obsessive compulsive. And uh, with this experience, I, I had an opportunity to not f- ask for forgiveness, um, like the the programming that I thought was the case growing up in Christianity, but rather just open myself up to vulnerability and experience a, d- a direct, full, holistic connection with love. Um, and in doing so, was going to be uh, uh, critical to this was healing the the pain of my divorce. And oddly enough, in this experience, I'm sitting there. What what you know, if you can, I've probably painted some level of um, picture to this subsequent to the experience. But what I remember is feeling almost like on my knees in front of this light. And uh, with me was Megan's spirit and w- w- Mimi's just just presence. And I, I felt hold, felt like I was holding her hand and knew that a part of this whole thing was going to be healing our uh, uh, the heartbreak that I'd experienced through our divorce and, you know, no connection to like, Oh, we need to get back together or anything, but rather it was so important that there were three into three spirits in that moment. It was myself. It was this light that I had interpreted as God at that moment. And then it was, was Megan. And I knew that whatever that meant, like those were the energies that were my priority for, for my life. And so after this experience, and I had a bunch of other downloads too, just overwhelming gratitude for my parents, weeping with just the, the weight that they put on their backs. They come from just poverty and have built successful lives and given my siblings and I just a beautiful life. And so I felt this just, I mean, I'm still getting chills about it, just overwhelming gratitude for them and their lives. Um, and, and a couple others, like I have, I have very obsessive compulsive tendencies and I felt this just as, as many describe, even in the scientific community, this just like cleaning of the windshield on your car as it pertained to these groomed patterns of obsessive compulsiveness. And so this was six hours, um, what felt like all night. Cause I just stayed up all night long and laid in blankets and just like stared starry eyed at the ceiling, even when I came back into the physical world. And, uh, I have never been the same. I've done a host of psychedelics since then never ha- quite had the same experience where it was like, I am so fucking different from this eight hours prior to this. Um, and so just like a really almost storybook level blast off healing experience that clear like moment in my life where something will never be the same again jesus what a cool 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 story maybe i'm gonna get tears in a second but holy shit dude um very transformative what are your thoughts on that how many grams first of all it was somewhere around seven to eight grams okay when you went in did you feel like you went in to give the old version of you in for a trade like sort of like you you traded all the doubt all the things that made up this body and you swapped out all those parts that were clunky and didn't work anymore and didn't serve you they worked just fine they got you to where you are but you sort of swap these parts out and then you come back like a damn new person completely almost like a walk-in experiences i've sort of articulated this in a way that you really don't level up you sort of make your avatar your mind your body your everything a vibrational absolute match for the highest amount of energy the highest you can give you without your fucking head exploding right yeah still yeah. be able to like go to the DMV and shit. So is that something of what you're talking about as a just yes. a, a systemic overhaul? Beautiful explanation of that. And it's funny that that likely was not my intention. My I had gotten into a really functional, happy space in my life, working through all of my compulsiveness. I'd placed on the shelf of being it being okay, my divorce. You know, a couple years we're a couple years divorced at this point at least. Um, my little obsessive compulsive tendencies around fitness and nutrition, I'd built little ways to kind of function around it. I'd had enough relationships in my life. And so I'd kind of put my life into place on the shelf. And so when I went into this experience, I wasn't a train wreck. I'd gone through my bottoming out, if you will. And so I just went into the experience with a very open mind, 
at this point, I was really into self-development, but not necessarily spirituality. And so I was really into like Joe Dispenza and manifestation. And, um, but I wasn't really particularly interested in the woo. Um, and, and I was still in this spot of like agnostic where there's an energy out there. Don't know if it's loving, think it's pretty just indifferent. It's just some sort of really, really crazy intelligence that we'll never understand. Um, but I blasted off into this experience and was, and that's again, where I was like, building this little structure of okayness that was in between me and love. And love is the thing that has no rationale. There is no little perfectly okayness with love. It's brutal and it's beautiful and it's the most painful thing you'll ever experience. And it's the most blissful, uh, pleasure driven, uh, energetic taste that you'll ever experience. Um, but it also comes with just this irrational bouquet of, of feelings. And I was unwilling to, for all of it, I didn't want the highs or the lows because it was just okay to be in my little life box that I'd given definitions to. And as long as I could just, you know, look at this little resume in my life where I'd had everything perfectly placed and tied out nicely, it was going to be okay. And I just wanted to leave it there. And so I went into the experience just like, Oh, this is just me who loves to have life experiences. I'll travel the world and I'll uh, do drugs and I'll, you know, hang out with new and interesting people. And I just want life experience, but it just sort of blasted me through into just a deeper level of purpose and meaning like you described. Dude. Yeah. And this is what I'm saying. I always went in going, all right, we're going to see some colors. The wall's going to breathe. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm one with everything healed trauma. Yeah. I just got it. Yeah. You know, they're like, ping, 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 ping. So it's, it's just so interesting whenever you talk about this in this way, man, and how deep this goes. Uh, I'm just absolutely fascinated with your experience because you and I, uh, we mirror so much in our experience as well. Um, as far as our upbringing and everything like that, I had a little bit different of one, my first mushroom experience, but I want to hear about Mimi. So Mimi, how was your, what was your most profound one? I've had, we've had quite a few profound. Um, the one that keeps popping into my brain to, to speak about is one that we actually uh, had earlier this year around May. Um, it was the day before Mother's Day. And in my journal afterwards, as I was going through integration and just writing down everything that was coming to me and just working through some things, I, I called this the mother's journey. And I had gone into this journey. So this was a mushroom journey. Uh, Chase and I, and we, it's kind of hard to measure how much, but probably about three to four grams. So it wasn't super crazy heavy, but it was potent. It was, they were on point. Um, and so I went into this with some very tangible anxiety around the, the, the thought, the concept of being a mother. Um, we're kind of entering this next phase of our life where we're starting to talk about kids or a kid and just getting familiar with like, hey, what is this going to look like for us? Kind of like thinking about timelines, just dipping our toes into this. And I can feel my maternal internal knob, you know, of, of motherhood, of the mother archetype turning up its volume in me involuntarily. And so we've been talking about this quite a bit over the last year or so. And I could I could feel in my just waking sobriety these sort of what feels like intrusive, invasive, anxious thoughts. And I'm not an anxious person by nature. I'm really not. So to feel this level of anxiety attached to something that I think is going to be a wonderful experience was it's just unnerving and it's it's uncomfortable. Um specifically around the thought of having a child. What if there's something wrong with it? What if the pregnancy doesn't go well? What if the child is deformed? Like all of these like very unnecessary thoughts. And I couldn't help it. It felt like they were happening to me. So I went into this, this, um, this journey, you know, I wrote in my journal, I have, I'm having these anxious thoughts. I would love just some clarity around why this is coming up, what I can do, how I can shift my being, my interaction with Chase, like what needs to happen for this to be released. And um, so we put our eye shades on and go into this journey. And as Chase ex explained earlier, you know, typical mushroom journey where it starts out, you know, you're just starting to see colors and the kaleidoscope of beauty. And it's like, wow, this is amazing. Then I, within 10 minutes, I'm, I'm deep. And the first scene, for lack of a better word, is me in a bathtub. And one of the things I've always pictured for myself is birthing in water. So I'm in this tub and instead of holding a child, I am holding this 
huge, most beautiful, like tropical rose flower that I've never seen before. But I'm just captivated by this huge, this flower is as big as my head and I'm holding it in my hands. And I just feel this like just overwhelming, just awe of this beauty that I'm holding in my hands. And I know in my being that it's my child. It's This flower is a representation of my future child. And I'm just so in love with the beauty of this thing. And there's flowers that are like rushing over me through the water, just bathing me in this, in this beauty. And I just feel this overwhelming sense of beauty. Then the next scene shifts to my childhood home. And I, I am... I am experiencing the experience that my mother had. She was a single mom for much of my life. And she was the type of mother that did all her own painting. She did projects. She gardened. She barbecued. She worked nonstop to give our give me and my sisters a really wonderful childhood, a wonderful life. But what I didn't see, what she didn't allow us to see was the pain that she was in from experiencing life on her own. She didn't have any family in town. No one was around to help her. And I was her. I felt her deep pain, loneliness, crying herself to sleep in her own bed at night. And it was just so overwhelming. I was just sobbing. My eye mask was, I could have wrung it out with tears. It was soaked. I was just, it was like a despair almost of loneliness. And the medicine showed me that really intense experience because the next thing it showed me, it it needed to give me context because what it was, what I, the feeling that I got, the understanding, the download that I got was, okay, you just experienced the despair of loneliness uh, that your mother had, but that pales in comparison to the amount of love that she felt for you and your sisters. And the, the the love, the the despair does not even compare to the amount of love that you will feel for this child. It doesn't matter if this is wrong or that is wrong or it's not is exactly what you pictured in your mind. You are gonna you are gonna be so in love with this little being. And so it showed me just these different stages of understanding um as as a mother. And I it I was like nothing else I had ever experienced and from that I have just a new understanding and an almost a a direct obviously a direct experience that I can tug on that I can pull on anytime I feel those anxious thoughts like arising in my body they're easily squashed or rather just like acknowledged and released um because I have already experienced deep in my being what it what it felt like even just for a few minutes to be a mother and to be overwhelmed by love for your child. And so I came out of this and I was just like, the medicine, you have those experiences, you have those journeys where the medicine hears you, hears your intention and provides exactly what you need better than you could have scripted out for yourself or even thought of. Like, the context of the despair of my single mother, I would have never thought to even really meditate on that. But it was all just to provide context for me. And it was just truly magical. It was probably the most emotion that I've ever felt in a journey. And for that reason, it was definitely one of the most powerful. My God. Just the way that you two both have had your, has such profound experiences, but also the eloquence at which you present them is mind boggling. You're, you're taking us on such a journey and a story here with this that it's, it's connecting on so many levels. So thank you both so much for sharing this. And thank you both also for diving into the healing. This is something that's very important for folks. You think that we're trying to take mushrooms and shit. Uh, this is deep, deep healing work. And that's what we signed up for. The good and the bad, the crying, the sobbing through all of it. All of us can talk about experiences where they've been super profound. It's been the range of emotions. It's been the most elation, the most scary. We're crying, we're releasing, and it's all beautiful because it's all part of the ride. It's all gorgeous. Thank you both just so much, honestly. Bottom of my heart, bottom of everybody's heart. I feel this from everyone. Thanking you both for this. I wanted to touch on, uh, before we uh, call it here, uh, just sort of something fun here, and I'm genuinely curious about. 
mushrooms and these types of things, let's say specifically these woodland mushrooms, right? They're always associated or commonly associated with rather uh, fairies, gnomes, these sort of creatures that are in a different realm that are mischievous, that are fun, that hold knowledge, that hold wisdom, but they're also magical AF. Do you think that this is sort of a buffer zone between the two dimensions and that maybe with the right intent, you could sit there and call in and talk to fairies and shit? Mm. <laughs> This is definitely not uh, an area of expertise, I would say, but it is it is just fun to imagine and fun to uh, to to let yourself go down this this rabbit hole. I think that there is something there's like a seed of truth in in everything in all stories and fairy tales do have this this imagery of uh, fairies like the name fairy tale. Like, where did we get that? Um, I think that these do have some sort of weight, if not in reality, definitely in our psyche. And uh, just like the character of Jesus, if you sit in meditation long enough, you could, or you're in a journey or you're in breath work, you could connect to the character of Jesus. And maybe he wasn't even real. We don't know, but he's real in our psyche. We've all probably experienced something like that. So I think that it's not far, uh, not far off to say that you could use mushrooms or just meditation or breath work to open up that intention and experience uh, connection to fairies or gnomes or or whatever in the sort of fairy tale universe. I think that's totally possible. I personally I've never opened up that intention. So you're you're putting something on my long to-do list to maybe try next time in breath work or in meditation. Um, I think it's a really fun thought. Um, and they could absolutely be on the long list of things that mushrooms could be. They could certainly we know that they're portals to another to other realms. Why wouldn't it be possible that that they're opening up a realm to the fairy lands? I'm super open to that. I (laughs) love I love that space, too. I found myself I find myself in normal life lost in those mystical recreations of of those environments that include these these various creatures like gnomes and and fairies and and unicorns and centaurs. and, And I'm just so drawn to that naturally because. I think there's a layer of resonance, whether that's with just my soul and these past lives or these various realms that we partake in, but don't remember, um, or, or whether that's just available to us now. And it's a, it's a nudge to lean into it. Um, I've also known a bunch of people that I love and trust and believe with my entire heart that have had significantly more visual experiences than I've had. A lot of mine are, are quite energetic. Um, and there's that noetic sense of awareness and knowledge that takes place while the body's like buzzing and humming, or while you're off in just a mystical cosmos land of, of, you know, stars and rainbows and, and the kaleidoscope. Um, but I have had moments and experiences that it's so even hard to explain because it's so non-contextual with 3d world that we live in, but it'll, it'll be like, well, this geometrical pattern somehow talked to me you know or or like yeah or i've been in uh the pacific northwest actually and had um very heavy what seems like native american figures communicating to me in these types of experiences and even though they might have like four heads and 55 eyes (laughs) while they're talking to me i'm aware at least in my in my um consciousness that it is a native american uh chief of some kind and 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 they're giving me a message and so whether or not that's my brain giving me at least some level of recognition to something that i would then revere and be able to interpret the message from or whether it's quite literally this being that that's existing on a plane that i've just stepped into i don't care i'm fascinated by it it is real to me in either way you want to articulate that and that there is value to be had in the same way that like we've gone through past life regressions and and while i i like the idea of past lives a lot i also don't get offended or upset when someone would suggest that is your the 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 mysterious brain that we still don't know anything about giving you this sort of uh, projected experience of meaning in order to interpret something from it that you can take and integrate into your life in a healthy way. I'm down with that too. Awesome. Either way, I'm not going to attach my identity to one or the other. Rather, I'm more interested in the archetype behind all of it and know that there are tools to be pulled and integrated back into this you know, life experience that I'm having right now. 
Again, beautifully fucking put. Beautifully fucking put. Uh, and it, it's fun to think, though, uh, and I'm with y'all. There's These are uh, presuppositions. They're fun. They're uh, non-falsifiables, but they're also something you can't uh, prove is true or false. So it's what's wonderful about this place. And the more you imbibe in psychedelics, the more I feel that it expands your mind for possibilities and what's possible. Because you're literally seeing your couch sit there and wave and move, and you're like, <laughs> yeah. what is this? Why is it doing, you know, your your reality gets bent in such a way that it opens you to possibilities because this place is pretty sure of what it's all about. It's pretty sure of what you are. It's pretty sure that we're on a ball spinning around and that there's a sun air. If you question that shit, you're dumb. All of these things are so certain of, and that is what psychedelics offered me the opportunity to is see squeegee that third eye right clean. Like you said, dude, like cleaning a windshield. It is. It's yeah. squeegee right clean, dude. Um, and it's this insight that allows you to ask the cool freaky woo woo questions here. And I think it's dope as shit. And then maybe, yeah, there is some sort of fairy element to this where maybe we're the reincarnated carnation of a fey type being that speaks through mushrooms or that's our conduit through and then sort of like unlock something in us to remember oh shit we're here to do like some super dope stuff because lizard turds aren't that big a fan of psychedelics that's in my understanding i mean they're not running around there snatching up kids while tripping you know what i mean it's a, it's a fucked up thing and it doesn't have any place in the peaceful beautiful fairy realm that we're in and so it feels like maybe we're some sort of incarnation of this awesome realm that we have access to through psychedelics we have glimpses of let's say and then but really it's sort of our message it's a comfort it's sort of a message home like hey dude you're crushing it this is here for you just sort of and like you said it's whatever contextualized way you want to uh, color this realm and i completely get to this because i went through the uh, church like you atheist for a minute um conversations with god that book by neil donald walsh i say he's the reason i'm not an atheist but i would have figured it out like you eventually right but he was the one that was like all right we're done with that but these ideals that there are amazing things here that you can interact with, interface with, that show you just such a different reality here. And no matter what you want to paint this to, because again, life is inherently meaningless. If you want to sit down with that and sit there with it, it's absolutely true. But there are mushrooms around here and there we can talk about fairies and they're like dope shit we can do. And I think it makes it so much more fun, but also it's so much more of a connective tool for people who are also into some dope shit and freaky woo woo aside. It's just all fun and connection. I love this place. Yeah. This yeah. realm, 100%. Yeah. All right, guys. So uh, we'll close it out here, but all the ways again to uh, find y'all located down in the show description. I'm going to leave y'all with the last word, if you don't mind, invite you to participate in that, which is just tell us what you're looking forward to. Tell us what gets you out of bed every morning. What keeps the feet hitting the ground and keeps you moving with those beautiful smiles that you have? <laughs> um, for me, exploring the cosmos, our relationship, love, just everything, life, with Chase, uh, with this person who sees all of me, knows all of me, sometimes sees me better than I see me and and sees all of that, the good, the bad, the dark, the light, everything and finds it beautiful and wants to participate with me. That is my greatest gift in this life. And that's definitely um, just a, a theme throughout. But I would say specifically for me right now, what is really getting me out of bed is uh, this creative project that I'm working on. Um, it's called Clear and Free. It's a course meant for women who are navigating uh, healing, clearing HPV, human papillomavirus, which is the virus that if un untreated can lead to cervical cancer. And I'm, I'm creating it alongside uh, Dr. Nathan Riley, who I think would be an amazing guest for your for your show. I think you would absolutely love him. He's a holistic OBGYN and we're coming together with my knowledge of mushrooms and healing of the body, culinary nutrition expert with his uh, holistic OBGYN exper expertise. We're coming together and creating this course for women. It's it's a nine week uh, online course. And it's just, it's so much work, but it's a labor of love because I know, I, ha I just have this feeling, I am confident that it's actually going to save lives. Um, and that's really, really meaningful for me right now. It's outstanding. Let us know if we can be a service in any way. We're uh, mm. you know all of that. So outstanding. And I love the birth uh, analogies here. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I'm excited about all of this stuff and it will all be located. Absolutely. Chase, what do you think, dude? What keeps you moving? 
Well, it's, it's piggybacking on everything Mimi said, um, the, the medicine and that's our podcast and our business and just what, what the ethos of our life, which is just, we constantly just say like, damn, dude, this is medicine. This is so medicine. Um, and that's become a habit. And, and I'm, my, my deep curiosity for what that is Nick. you know, where, where else do the medicines live? And, uh, you know, practically I'm, I'm sunsetting, a about a 10 year career in, in, a, in finance and accounting, the last five years of which have been in the startup space for, uh, wellness products and health and wellness, uh, moving more into an advisory role there. That's going to be smaller time. And then stepping into our business and our passion full time, which is uh, just just so exciting. And so I've lived in in my masculine brain for a long, long time. Um, creativity, play, bliss, novelty have been this tiny little allocation of time and energy that, that uh, has made up the portion of my life for the last 10 years or so. And so really stepping into um, creativity and, and uh, play. And, and although the medicine in our business has been uh, kind of a, a smaller role for me the last few years, uh, we're ready to jump into the deep end and, and see what we can do not only to uh, find purpose at a deeper uh, level for us, but also just like, damn it, dude, I really, really, really want to help people. I feel like there is so much fixing available in the world and it will be healed grassroots. It will be healed through relationships. Everything is a relationship. It's a relationship with ourselves, our body, uh, the food that we're eating, the nature that we're a part of, these these incredible teachers that we call our partners and our friends and our community. And it's going to start with changing me and, and improving me, my relationships, the way that I interact with the environment around me, my community, my neighborhood. And if that starts to change, if individual people start to become more life affirming on a daily basis, and it doesn't have to be perfect, it can quite literally just be like, damn it, dude, I want to be better today. If it starts with individuals taking that responsibility, we will change. We will materially, significantly impact the world. And weirdly enough, we all have the power to do so as long as we're collectively doing it.